Good morning, everybody. Uh, beautiful day out here today. So I wanted to stop and uh, take some time to make a video with you this morning to uh, share uh, about the the ten maxims maxims sorry ten maxims of uh, commercial law. Now um, this video is not legal advice. It is for entertainment purposes only. Uh, I would advise everyone to do their own research and make your own decisions. So um, here we go. So the, the 10 maxims of commercial law, as commonly referenced today, are they're very old. Um, they do not have a specific date of codification. However, they are derived from a combination of historical legal traditions, moral principles, and practices that have evolved over the centuries. Elements of these maxims can be traced back to ancient legal systems, including Roman law, Mosaic law, Babylonian law, as well as various religious texts. In Western legal tradition, these principles have been shaped significantly by the development of common law and the writings of legal scholars. The principles of natural law and equity have also contributed to their form formulation. Therefore, while there isn't a precise date for their codification, the roots of the ten maxims of law lie in a long historical process that goes back for thousands of years. Uh, so let's get into it. The, the, first, the first maxim of commercial law, uh, and, and once you learn these ten basic precepts, they're going to empower you to do some pretty incredible things that that uh, um, give you a lot of power and a lot of authority when you understand these 10 basic concepts or precepts of commercial law. Number one <clears throat> is that the workman is worthy of his hire. Uh, this, this comes from, from the Bible. Uh, this principle is first expressed in Exodus 20 verse 15, uh, Leviticus 19 verse 13, Matthew 10 10, Luke 10, 7, 2 Timothy 2, 2 6. Um, and the legal maxim is, says it, it is against equity for free men not to have the free disposal of their own property. The second maxim is equality before the law, or more precisely, all are equal under the law. We're hearing a lot of that these days. You know, it's like nobody's above the law and then they go and break the law and then accuse, uh, you know, uh, someone else of doing exactly what they're doing. Uh, but that's another subject for another video. So uh, all are equal before the law. No one is above the law. This is founded on both natural and moral law and is binding on everyone. For someone to say or act as though he is above the law is insane. And this is the major insanity in the world today. And man continues to live, act, and believe, and form systems or organizations uh, and governments, laws and processes, which presume to be able to supersede or abrogate natural law. But under commercial law, nat uh, the law of nations ought to be common and not to be converted into a monopoly and the private gain of the few, which is exactly what we're seeing go on in the world today. Uh, the law is formulated to, to uh, benefit those at the top. A few bureaucrats at the FBI, 51 intelligence agents, etc. Uh, you know, the ultra rich, the ultra wealthy, the ultra powerful, and those that are in government. But the, the maxim is that no one is above the law. N maxim number three is in commerce, truth is sovereign. Uh, this is one of the most comforting maxims you could have and your foundation for your peace of mind and your security and your capacity to win and triumph, to get your remedy uh, in this business. The truth is sovereign and the sovereign tells only the truth. Your word is your bond, and if truth were not sovereign in commerce, that is, all action and interrelations, there would be no basis for anything. No basis for law and order, no basis of accountability. There would be no standards, no capacity to resolve anything. 
It would mean anything goes, each man for himself, and nothing matters. That's worse than the law of the jungle. Uh, so truth is sovereign in commerce. And you don't get to make up your own truth. You don't get to make up your own facts. So the principle in law is that truth is sovereign. And we see the attack going on, uh, you know, in, in the political world today that, you know, we can just make up anything that we want to make up. We can, you know, accuse anybody of the thing that we, we happen to be doing or they happen to be doing. Um, you know, you, you know, there are, you know, 187 genders and, uh, you know, and so there, there is no, there is no truth. And it is this attack on the truth that has caused the confusion. And so when, when we, uh, you know, when we don't all agree on some, some basic principles of truth and let truth reign supreme and absolute truth be sovereign, then uh, we, we're going to devolve into anarchy. And we already see that happening today. Uh, maxim number four, truth is expressed in the form of an affidavit. Now, this is really powerful. And this is, I'm going to show you how to use this in a minute. Truth is expressed in the form of an affidavit. An affidavit is your solemn expression of your truth. In commerce, an affidavit must be accompanied and must underlay and form the foundation for any commercial transaction whatsoever. There can be no valid commercial transaction without someone putting their neck on the line and stating this is true and correct. Uh, complete and not meant to mislead. When you issue an affidavit, it is a two-edged sword that cuts both ways. Someone has to take responsibility for saying that it is that it is a real and factual situation. It can be called a true bill. And as they say in the grand jury, a true bill of commerce. When you issue an affidavit in commerce, you get the power of an affidavit. And, and Again, they don't teach us this, but an affidavit of truth that is uh, signed and sworn by a notary uh, is extremely powerful in business and in law. So, <clears throat> so things change by your affidavit, which are going to affect people's lives. If what you say in your affidavit is in fact not true, then those who are adversely affected can come back at you with justifiable recourse because you lied. It don't ever lie on an affidavit. Don't ever put your signature on something that is stamped by a notary that is not true and correct, because if you do, you're going to be in a lot of trouble. Um, having a notary stamp your, stamp your affidavit is the same as having the Secretary of State witness your signature and there is a lot of power that comes with that and i'm going to show you how to use that power uh as we continue right here in this video and we'll we'll be coming back to this over and over and and uh, you know exploring different aspects and different layers and going deeper with this um so if what you say in your affidavit is in fact not true then those who are adversely affected can come back at you with justifiable recourse you have told a lie as if it were truth, and people depend on your affidavit, and then they have lost because you lied. Now, this comes from uh, the Bible, uh, this very basic principle of law, uh, Leviticus 19, 11 through 13, where he says, you shall, not deal, you shall not steal, nor deal falsely, nor lie to one another. And you shall not swear by my name falsely, nor shall you profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. You shall not cheat your neighbor, nor rob him. The wages of him who is hired shall not remain with you all night until morning. So there was a principle, even in the Mosaic law, that you, you didn't get to hold uh, anyone's... Um, wages, someone had worked for you, 
you didn't get to hold their wages overnight. You had to pay them by the day uh, because they, they had worked, they had spent their energy and their time, and they deserve to be compensated by the day or as the day goes. Principle number five or precept number five says, an unrebutted affidavit stands as truth in commerce. So th this is very powerful. An unreba unrebutted affidavit stands as truth in commerce. Claims made in your affidavit, if not rebutted, emerge as truth in the matter. So w when you put something on an affidavit and you, you state, th you know, this is true and factual and correct and you've had it sealed and signed, unless the other party comes back and, and rebuts your affidavit, then if that matter ever ends up in court or in a tribunal of some sort, an unrebutted affidavit stands in truth. So if they don't come back and say, no, I disagree, this is why this is not factual, that is not factual, et cetera, et cetera, then, then that affidavit stands as truth in commerce. And um, I mean, you can, you can say whatever is, is true and factual, and unless they come back and, and um, rebut it, now you can even put your interpretation of the facts, your interpretation of, of what you see as the facts, as long as you're not blatantly lying because you can't blatantly lie. Uh, and if the other party does not come back and rebut your affidavit, um, then it stands as truth in commerce. And you, know, and, and you can use this to keep yourself out of court. Uh, because when you put forth an affidavit and then send it uh, with, uh, by certified mail, uh, return receipt requested, you actually are already in court. Um, and you can, I'm going to show you how to, how to do a conditional acceptance here at the end of this video. So you're going to want to stay tuned um, because uh, th that is very powerful. But the principles of a conditional acceptance are all built on this very thing right here, how to use these 10 maxims of commercial law to your advantage. Uh, uh, maxim number six, an unrebutted affidavit becomes judgment in commerce. There is nothing left to resolve. Any proceeding in a court, tribunal, or arbitration forum consists of a contest or a duel of commercial affidavits, wherein the points remaining unrebutted at the end stand as truth and matters to which the judgment of law is applied. So when you're going back and forth with affidavits between yourself and another party with whom you may have a dispute and you're saying, you know, A is factual and correct and they're coming back and saying, you know, no, A is not factual and correct and here's why. And then you go back with your affidavit, uh, you know, and, and, and rebut that. <coughs> Whatever remains unre unrebutted stands before the tribunal. It stands before the judge, and those are the facts that are then uh, applied where where judgment uh, is applied. So uh, an unrebutted affidavit becomes judgment in commerce, and I'm going to show you how to use affidavits in the form of a conditional acceptance to um, resolve disputes. Uh, for a whole lot less than it would cost you to go into a court and go through all the legal, uh, jump through all the legal hoops. So uh, it, it's a whole lot less expensive, it's a whole lot more effective, and it's a lot more powerful uh, by using an affidavit. Uh, maxim number seven, in commerce, for any matter to be resolved, it must be expressed. So no one is a mind reader and you have to put your position out there. You have to state what the issue is that is being dispute, disputed. You have to talk to someone about it and resolve it. Uh, the, and the legal, there's another legal maxim that says, he who fails to assert his rights has none. And so I am a firm believer um, in, in asserting my legal rights. 
And we have in this country have been, you know, pushed, we have been pushed back step by step in letting our rights go and letting our right to privacy go and letting our right to free speech be regulated, letting our right to bear arms be regulated to where we have none. Uh, and, and unless we begin to assert our rights um, in this country, uh, then we're going to be in a we're, we're going to be in a lot worse situation than we're already in here pretty quickly. Uh, so you have to assert your rights because if you don't, you are considered to have none. Nobody's going to stand up for your rights. You have to learn how to do it yourself. And it is our job to teach our uh, public servants, that is the police, the judges, uh, the city managers, the mayor, the politicians. It is our responsibility as the people to assert our rights under uh, by God-given law under the Constitution of the United States because if we don't assert our rights, then we are assumed to have done and uh, we're going to end up in the situation that we're already in today and uh, even worse uh, if we don't start asserting our rights. So in commerce, for any matter to be resolved, it must be uh, expressed. You've got to learn uh, and find the courage to speak up for yourself. Um, <clears throat> Maxim number eight, he who leaves the battlefield first loses by default. So if you walk away and you drop a matter and you don't respond to the, to let's say someone sends you a bill or they send you um, an order to pay, they send you an affidavit. Uh, if you don't come back with an affidavit of your own uh, stating why you disagree with the facts or stating why you are asserting your rights under the law, then you have lost by default. And whatever they say stands as truth in, in, in judgment, okay? Um, maxim number nine. Sacrifice is the measure of credibility. No willingness to sacrifice equals no liability, no responsibility, no authority or measure of conviction. You know, the old maxim says, nothing ventured, nothing gained. So a person must put himself on the line and assume a position, must take a stand as regards the matter at hand. One cannot realize the potential gain without also exposing himself to the threat of potential loss. One who is not damaged or put at risk or willing to swear an oath on his commercial liability to claim authority for the truth of his statements and legitimacy of his actions has no basis to assert claims or charges and forfeits all credibility. So. Uh, the, the, the legal maxim, he who bears the burden ought to also derive the benefit. So again, it, it, this is kind of reflective of the, of the maxim that we just um, went over. You've got to put yourself out there. You've got to take, be willing to take a risk to uh, assert your rights. You know, in, in, in you know, states where uh, constitutional carry uh, of firearms is is legal. I'll go into uh, you know a grocery store, a restaurant, uh, anywhere I go. I will openly carry a firearm. Why? Because I think I need it. I might, uh, but it's more about asserting my right to do so. And unless we start asserting our rights that we have under uh, under God not by the Constitution. The Constitution merely enumerates or, um, you know, uh, catalogs the rights that we have been already given by God. Uh, man is endowed. The Constitution says man is endowed by his creator with certain unalienable rights. And so that, that, those are rights that were given by God. They were not conferred upon you by government. They are given by God. 
and we have to be willing to sacrifice because our willingness to sacrifice is the measure of credibility in law. Maxim number 10, a lien or claim can only, listen to this now, this is, this is powerful. A lien or claim can only be satisfied through rebuttable, rebuttable affidavit point by point, resolution by jury, or the lien must be paid. Uh, and we're going to be studying and learning here on this channel a little bit more about the power of a commercial lien. Uh, you know, don't sue. Don't bother suing. Just lien. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about what that means. You can place a lien on another's property if they have wronged you by filing the proper affidavits and getting justice without ever going into court. Um, so satisfaction of a lien in commerce, a lien or claim can be satisfied in any one of three ways by someone rebutting your affidavit, we, which we've already discussed with another affidavit of his own point by point until the matter is resolved as to who is correct. In the case of non-resolution, you're sending affidavits back and forth. You know, you send an affidavit to a party and say, this is true and correct, and these are the facts of the case. Now, one, if they don't respond, they don't say anything and come back with a sworn affidavit of their own, not just a mere declaration, not a letter, not a phone call, not a statement, but a sworn affidavit that has been stamped by the with a notary seal uh, under their commercial liability, then then your affidavit is going to stand as truth. Now that's very powerful. Your affidavit will stand in truth. However, if they come back to you with an affidavit of their own, then you begin to rebut point by point, and you go back and forth through the through affidavits until the matter is resolved. However, now if you can't uh, resolve your matter through by going back and forth with affidavits, you can convene a sheriff's common law jury. You can go, and I never realized this until I began to look into these matters that um, the power of your local sheriff, your local sheriff, your county sheriff is the, the constitutional authority in your county. So get to know your sheriff. Make friends with your sheriff's department. Uh, <clears throat> so you can go to the sheriff and you can order a common law jury convened through your uh, local sheriff. Uh, one thing I would highly suggest is that you find out if your local sheriff is a member of the CSPOA. Remember that, CSPOA. The name of the orga uh, uh, organization is the Constitutional Sheriffs and Peace Officers Association. There is a, a, um, an association called the CSPOA where the sheriffs uh, across this country have gotten together and they are committed to enforcing the constitutional rights of the citizens. So this group advocates for the role of sheriffs and peace officers in upholding our constitutional rights. And based on, listen to this, based on the Seventh Amendment concerning a dispute involving a claim of more than $20, the only other way is to, to satisfy a lien or to pay for it. So the Seventh Amendment to the Constitution guarantees the right to a jury in certain civil cases. Now, I said civil, not criminal. Civil cases. This is commercial. Civil, civil disputes are commercial disputes. Um, <clears throat> in a civil case, and, and this prevents uh, courts from overturning a jury's findings of fact. Uh, specific, quoting here from the Constitution, the Seventh Amendment, in suits at common law, 
where the value in controversy shall exceed $20, the right of trial by jury shall be preserved, and no fact tried by a jury shall otherwise be re-examined in any court of the United States than according to the rules of common law. So here's, here's what that means in plain English. If you have a commercial dispute with someone that you cannot resolve by affidavit, point by point, you have the right to go to your local sheriff and convene a sheriff's grand jury. Now, this is, this is mind-blowing. I, I had no idea. This is how we take our power back, folks. This is how we teach our public servants that they are not lords of the manor. They are not kings. They are not sovereigns. They are servants. You are the sovereign. You are the king and the queen. Uh, and so we have the right to convene a sheriff's grand jury. And it states right here, according to the Seventh Amendment, that no fact tried by a jury shall otherwise be re-examined in any court of the United States. In other words, if you get a judgment by a local sheriff's grand jury, that's it. That is the end of the story. No higher court. There is no higher court to appeal to. There is no higher court to go to. Once that has been done, a sheriff's grand jury under common law that's the end of the matter. Uh, so this amendment ensures that civil cases involving significant sums of money, remember, more than $20, uh, can be decided by a jury, and it limits the power of judges to alter the jury's verdict. There is, once, once a jury has made a decision in a, in a commercial matter, no judge can overturn that. So get out of the courts. Go to a sheriff's grand jury. <laughs> that that's per, that's really powerful when you understand the significance of that that is extremely powerful and puts the puts the power in your court um <clears throat> so the united states supreme court in 1969 in a case called snydak versus Fi family finance corp states this is the opinion of the supreme court and i'm quoting the ability to place a, me a lien on a man's property, such as to temporarily deprive him of its beneficial use without any judicial determination of probable cause, dates back not only to medieval England, but also to Roman times. So you can take a, uh, a sh the, the determination of a sheriff's grand jury or an unrebutted affidavit and you can use that to then file a lien which i'm going to do a video on that on the process of how to not only file a lien but then it's another matter to walk through the steps to get that lien actually enforced um i had a I had a situation where i worked for a company um uh for a while and they uh they decided they didn't want to pay me uh, so, um, I sent them an affidavit of truth. Uh, they did not respond. Uh, so then I sent them, uh, filed a lien. I went down to the county courthouse and I filed a lien on them. Uh, and then I took steps to begin enforcing that lien through the local sheriff. Once they saw that I meant business, well, guess what? They, uh, suddenly had a change of heart and they decided to pay me. So, um, again, I have done this and this is this is extremely powerful so now i want to show you how to do a conditional acceptance uh and a, a conditional acceptance uh is basically it's it's a commercial affidavit and so uh this is actually the the lien or the uh, conditional acceptance that i sent to the company that i just mentioned so i'm gonna turn it over here and I hope you can see that. It says here, conditional acceptance. Uh, <clears throat> in other words, what you're saying when you say conditional acceptance, you're saying that I conditionally accept your offer or your position. Uh, we're, I'm accepting. There, we're, not, we're not having a controversy here. I am accepting 
on these following conditions, or this is a conditional acceptance. Now, and then under here, I wrote, this is not a 